for RCRTV, I'm Sean Kinney, and I want to introduce James Hayward, a technology analyst for ID Tech X. James, thanks for joining us this morning, and uh, I'm interested to learn a little bit more about wearables, particularly as they relate to the military vertical. So uh, as we get started, can you just kind of explain why wearables are a natural fit for military applications? Sure, absolutely. Um, so firstly, thank you for having me and it's great to speak to you this morning. Um, with regards to wearables in the military, it's, it's an area which dates back quite a long way into history. When we look at the wearables technology market as it is today, it very much re revolves around consumer orientated devices, which in all, uh, all in all are really enabled by Bluetooth Smart. So this comes in in sort of 2011-12, uh, integrated into the smartphone and then allows all of these wearable devices to come through. So this, when, when people talk about consumer wearables today, this is often where the focus is. But within the military space and going to wearable technology as a whole, there is obviously a very long history there, whether it be from a heads up display or to other electronic items that a soldier will be wearing on their body throughout, whether they're um, going to be an unmounted soldier or a pilot, a, um, a, a mariner and so on. Like there's many, many applications which they've been used and it, it dates back many, many years. So they're very contrasting areas of industry. But the thing, the thing that really makes um, uh, wearable technology suited to the military is there's several key points. Firstly, around improving the user interaction and experience with the technology. A good example for this would be in heads-up displays where a computer can do targeting for you based on um, a, a, an enemy aircraft or so on, or giving you other information around you. But how do you interact with that computer? You're not going to talk to it in binary. And so how, how can you do that such that it can recognize your gestures, recognize where you're looking, uh, and allow you to communicate with it? So this is something which a wearable in a heads-up display has, has optimized very well and has been implemented everywhere. So, and a second point I'd make is in making the overall system on the soldier more efficient. So this would be a, a good example here, which I'll refer to um, as a great example for wearables in the military, is the use of e-textiles or ele electronic textiles within a soldier's garment. So a typical soldier will have maybe five to six different battery types um, just for the different components. We'll have all sorts of communication, whether it be radios, uh, different um, GPS targeting sites and so on all requiring electronic use and all in many cases with individual cabling whether it be for data or power so what e-textiles can often do is allow this cabling to be integrated into the garment into the shirt and so on so this allows for um, any so the obsolete cables then become integrated and it becomes close to the body and it becomes much easier and more practical for the soldier and in the end makes it makes uh, decreases their load okay and yeah and you finally i guess another point go ahead carl sorry oh no i'm i'm sorry i was gonna ask you about the development process but please make your uh, your third point there oh no i was i was finally going to mention a third a third aspect um around sensing modalities on the body. So this is uh, one which has been a little bit controversial. I've, I've heard both sides argued. So the question is around having a, a shirt or garment which can sense the vital signs of the user. Now, at the first, in the first, and, and speaking with an optimist's voice, this would be an excellent use for the military, allowing to improve things like training, monitor the heart rate of a soldier, check their activity, uh, check their sweat levels or so on and all of these things which can be overall help to improve the uh, action of the, of the soldier and and whilst whilst you see the positives I've heard acting personnel say the absolute opposite which is to say that sentiment be a regulatory nightmare would actively stop the soldier doing their duty because they're worried they would, might not be in the right say between in the right heart rate band in order to make an appropriate decision and so on. So really, that there are two there are two schools of thought around that. And whilst many people are targeting and using this, I think ultimately I'm I'm with that the serving soldiers saying that 
it, it may be useful in a training regime and to look at the data afterwards, but live recording of data on a soldier is probably not something that's useful. However, within wearable technology, it allows people to make that decision as to whether they want it or not, which is very important. Yeah, so I was, uh, relative to the development process, when we talk about these very specific sort of use cases for the technology, how do the people that develop the, the actual product, how do they balance what the soldier is going to need in the field at, versus what's uh, technologically possible? How do they kind of strike the right medium there? Well, through in short, through a very, very long and process with many iterations. Yeah. And ultimately, it, it's, it's not just coming down to what soldiers need, full stop. It's going to come down to the individual in many cases. And therefore, often the thing that is most important in these systems is, is a some degree of customizability whilst maintaining uh, a set of standards, which means it has reliability. So for an example, uh, I, I gave the example of integrating everything within a smart garment. Uh, depending on whether the, for example, whether the soldier is right or left-handed, it will be holding uh, a weapon and, and uh, ammunition and so on in various different places on their body. This also varies by role in a platoon uh, and, and all the connections. So there's going to be no standard setup. And therefore, what a lot of these companies are doing is looking at standardizing the connectors, standardizing the, the, the power management system, uh, and so forth as ways to do it. Another, another good example, for example, is uh, in, I talked about heads-up display and maybe in night vision goggles. So different soldiers it, within the same operation even will prefer to either use them or not. And you get, if you, use of night vision goggles over a long period of time can result in real uh, fati eye fatigue. And therefore, it's often the ability to switch between using them or not, or partly using them, using them for certain operations, or some people may want to use them throughout or not at all. And the point being that there has to be this level of customizability. There has to be a level of flexibility such that each individual can make choices. And we're seeing this move also through into the more general consumer wearable space where it turns out that buying a single uh, Apple Watch with a single band isn't good enough anymore. So the huge diversification of of these uh, of the uh, accessories is now coming into play. So I mean, there's there's parallels throughout, but ultimately, uh, where customizability is the key point. So James, you mentioned um, wearables in in military application as uh, handling a, a huge volume of, of personal data. I think you mentioned sort of like medical or, or bio data, but uh, mm. when I think about the consumer wearables market, data security, data privacy is a huge issue. I got to imagine when we're talking about a military application that that security and privacy aspect is even more important. So how do you? How do you keep up with the the sort of the need to to manage those security functions while also knowing that the people that are trying to uh, incur you know past your security walls are constantly adjusting your approach? Well, I think this, this comes back to the sort of second point I made about the regulatory nightmare around sensing all of the vital signs of a, of, a, of an active military personnel. So it in the, it just won't happen because of it. You can't. If, if, for example, your heart rate was 10 beats per minute too high and therefore you, you can be claimed to have acted brashly and uh, taken someone's life when you, went, when you could have made it a better decision. And, the, and therefore, it just, it just puts huge barriers on the use of these kind of sensing modalities in, act, in active service. So, and, and that's certainly a big case. I mean, moving into the consumer space, it's kind of a different question in many ways because whilst, whilst I've... And been part of and heard many a discussion around data privacy, and everyone's got their own soapbox to stand on when it comes to this kind of thing. Ultimately, the things that our mobile phones are already doing are probably, in many cases, much worse. Like I've seen, I've seen the, uh, for example, I'm an iPhone user. I've seen the uh, the frequent locations app, which is automatically turned on with every update, and it knows where I work, it knows where I go, to, it knows where I shop, it knows all my social life and probably all my friends' social lives and, and so on. And I think the question around data security is, is more a case of uh, 
with with wearables, if it can be managed for the mobile phone, it'll be managed for the wearables. And into the medical space, it becomes a little bit more um, dodgy. But in the end, uh, the, the problems haven't been solved in the mobile phone industry to the general public. It's been kept quite quiet. The amount that the likes of Google and Apple already know about us is already huge. And the fact is, people still uh, use Google as a search engine and buy iPhones. So it, it's it's very much a case of, yes, long term, it will be important. But certainly, the developers aren't going to get hung up on worrying over, over worrying about security problems uh, in 2015, when really, they can just be making products, getting some traction in the market, and then worrying about it in five years' time. Mm -hmm. And James, I mentioned in my email that I went to an uh, IEEE Computer Society event here in Austin cool. last week that was all dedicated to wearables. And uh, one of the panelists that's actually a wearables manufacturer, he said that uh, what keeps him up at night is the thought that in five years' time, the wearables market will have disappeared because embedded sensors and you know the different applications associated with them, the price point will have been such that that's the preferable technology. So can you kind of help me understand uh, when we talk about challenges to wearables adoption, like security, like form factor, like the need to you know better integrate the components, have more miniaturization in the components. Do you think by the time that all of that has been solved, that we'll be at this point where sensors are now available and the preference, and I guess to ask that another way, it, does the wearables market kind of have a shelf life from your perspective or it's something with a long runway? Well, I think a good, a good example to look at is the clothing industry and the textiles industry and in that it is, we're going to wear clothes. We're going to, we're going to have things on us as style in terms of style. We're going to, and, and many people talk about wearable technology becoming fashionable as the key point. And you tell that to a bunch of engineers and they don't understand. And it's, it's, it's really, it, it's, it's a really important step with regards to st stuff like, uh, you're referring to implantable devices. Is that right? And, yeah. Yeah. And these kind of sensors. So, and I think the important thing to note here is you've got to remember that in order to get one of these things, you have to have invasive surgery, which, which I think I, I don't know about, Maybe for the earliest of earlier adopters, it's okay. But to go under the knife in order to count my steps, that's not quite right. So I think it's really about finding the, um, finding the use case. So for example, take Medtronic. They have been making uh, artificial pacemakers, implantable defibrillators, heart rate monitors for uh, like late life care, checking on, checking on the elderly and so on for many, many years, talking 30, 40 or more years. And these have been sat in the chest and implantable and two-year battery life and so on. These are already very, very big business and much bigger than most of these wearables companies can even dream of. So, and, and, and they already have the connectivity and sensing modalities that many people would expect from a big company. Uh, but whether that becomes something like a smartphone interface or a consumer wearable or even a, a headset with some bone conduction microphone, I mean, to go through and to go through invasive surgery to gain that is such a big cost to the user, mm. and therefore I think what well I think you said to me in the email five years as being scared of it. I think there will be some examples in five years, and sure you hear, and when you hear rumours uh, and and talk around things like well the RF attenuation of human tissue isn't too bad, <laughs> therefore we can wirelessly charge an implantable device and it can be instead of having a two year or six month or whatever it is, a uh, use life, you're talking about indefinite life. And you hear, you hear things like this and, and they're coming out of the medical space and it will have part to play. But I think consumer uh, implantables in five years is possibly a bit, uh, a bit optimistic. Yeah. So uh, keep that same uh, five year time frame. How do you see uh, adoption of wearables in the military space uh, taking shape over the, the short term there? So I think, and like I say, we have, to, we have to put it in context of history and wearables have been in the military for 20 plus years. Uh, one key, and with the e-textiles the e project I mentioned, that's, that's beginning to take some, there's a, um, there have been contracts now between the US military um, 
which uh, BAE Systems and a company called Intelligent Textiles, which is a small startup based, oh, it's not really a startup anymore, but it's a small company based in London. They uh, have now won contracts to start developing for the US military directly. They've done work with the UK military, the Canadian military, and so on with this kind of integrated data and power systems garment, which if it's part of every unmounted soldier in active duty, will be a big market immediately. I think it's a $20 billion market, the... Um, the uh well i think it's all of the military apparel and so on market uh so it's and, and i think these projects are starting are going to be starting to roll out formally towards the end of this year into next year so the demonstrators have been shown for maybe well eight nine years now and yet the contracts are just landing now so we've got to understand how time scales work in this kind of industry uh Wearables will have a place, but if a consumer wearables company expects to just make the jump between consumer into the military space, then you've got to have a really, really good use case and some true innovation because chances are they've looked at it before. So, James, what, uh, what if any wearables do you use on a recurring basis? I don't. Don't? Yeah, I don't either. I don't. It's, 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 a really, it's a really odd situation for me to be in, looking at wearables on a daily basis and uh, as an analyst. And I am I am completely yeah. risk free. Uh, I've never worn a watch in my life. Uh, I have tried many different wearables, uh, from cameras to glasses to fitness trackers and so on. And and I guess it's it's quite strange for a non early adopter to be in this kind of role. But it also allows me when I find something that will have a true uh, true value to myself then I feel that going forward will be really relevant. And I'm close to getting an Apple Watch, I must say, just, just to try it. I'm, I'm already integrated in the Apple ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll, just to try it out more than anything, but I'm also interested to see what, what the response to Apple um, product will be this year from the likes of Samsung, LG, and so on. So it will be a very interesting time, certainly, for the wearable space. Yeah, I do. I do get interested in the in the consumer wearables just because yeah, I'm like you. We're both work in in this industry in in some fashion. I don't use any wearables either, and it's uh, I don't know. At this point, it's not that the the form factor's off for me. It's just that the service offering doesn't really justify the the cost to me, or and the you know the act of having to charge a watch every day. It just isn't supported by the services that I could get. So I, I'm just, I'm, I don't know if I'm even waiting for the killer app anymore. I don't know what I'm waiting for, but I'm just, what are your thoughts on, on consumer adoption? What's, what's sort of the tipping point we need to get to where more people are going to be using wearables than won't be using wearables? Well, I think it's, it's a case of want versus need. Yeah. And whilst the, whilst the, an Apple watch can be a good fashion statement, uh, Things to say, but the important thing, the important work is going on. So I, and in terms of this, I'd say, look at the Taptic module. So this is the new Haptic system. It's a custom, large sized linear L LRA Haptic motor effectively in, inside the Apple Watch. They've also put it in the, the 6S, iPhone 6S now. It's also in the MacBook. So they've been developing this technology and it's now mature enough to implement. This is something which was developed specifically for wearables because the old motors were were annoying and well and just the sort of buzz it wasn't right they were too power hungry and so on and now by using this technology you can have a really meaningful click and variation and uh, low frequencies and all of the things that really are much better for a human interaction so it's this kind of technology that will really take it and, and nobody's going to go out and buy an apple watch because it's got a tactic module in it not at all but it's this kind of thinking where it's becoming really a design and innovation based on how it's going to interact with the user and this is what the smart watch companies are doing this is what will happen in the eyewear space in a bit of a further further down the line we'll see new iterations of these products and they'll be more user friendly they'll start finding their use cases and markets but the point is the development's now going on it was enabled like i said right back at the start by this by bluetooth as being a, an amazing bluetooth 4.0 is an amazing low power um, sort of ubiquitous communication technique and now what will happen is it will go into, and all of the other aspects other than communication will start to catch up. 
So whether it be wireless charging for the battery, energy harvesting for picking up the ambient energy around you, display technology to get it low power with a wider field of view, say, or, or better color contrast and, and or, or, or passive displays such that you're not using as much power, uh, sensors such that it's not just a chip that's been in your car for 20 years, but things that are uh, a, a soft, formable, more, more, uh, they require PCBs to sit on and, 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 and all of these aspects that we cover actively. And this is really where, as a wearable analyst and within an emerging tech firm, is exciting to be because this is where the cutting edge is. This is where the technology is really bringing something new to the wearables market that will, that will enable this growth we predict. All right, James. Well, I really appreciate you taking us a, a moment to fill us in on the work ID Tech X is doing and uh, giving us an overview of the military wearable space. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's my pleasure.